On Friday, March 1st through Sunday, March 3rd, 2013, the Historic Districts Council held their 19th annual Preservation Now Conference. The Preservation Conference focused on how preservation has brought a positive impact to both local neighborhoods and the city as a whole. A wide range of speakers presented a number of case studies on ongoing preservation projects, as well as discussed current neighborhood battles. Not only about buildings, as, uh, as those of us who are involved in the in the study of vernacular architecture I always like to say vernacular architecture is about everyday buildings and the people who use them. Uh, so the, the people is a really a key issue. The turnout was remarkable and the audience was both enthused and inspired by the many compelling speakers. On Friday night, Dr. Clement Price gave an inspirational keynote speech. Preservation is a way to ennoble the past, to protect the past from the whims of the present. Within the context of American history, this long, complicated, and bittersweet story of our forebears. Enslavement, freedom, the quest for justice, and a place at the table. The past really, really matters. Should we not know this? Should we not value this and sustain it in multiple ways? then shame on us. The following day, we all gathered at the New York Law School, where we spent the day looking into case studies on a neighborhood-by-neighborhood -neighborhood basis. Many interesting speakers addressed a wide range of issues and neighborhoods. Andrew Dolcart, James Marston Fitch Associate Professor of Historic Preservation at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, was one. There is no campaign to save the garment district, at least not in the sense that we would think of it in this room. There is a campaign to preserve garment manufacturing in the area, uh, a, a campaign that I very much support, but not a campaign for the buildings where this manufacturing takes place, or at least took place in the past. But if, like me, you believe that historical research is a powerful tool for preservation, since, as I would argue, we need to identify and understand what is out there if we're going to fight to preserve it, then my efforts in the garment district are indeed a public preservation campaign. I've been researching the history of the Garment District and of the buildings in the Garment District uh, for several years. I've uh, done two articles, and I'm writing a book on this topic. And like all the books that I write, I hope that the book will be used as a tool for preservation. A study of the New York garment industry, published in 1959, opened by noting that, put the American woman on a subway train going from Pennsylvania Station to Times Square, and it will take her just 65 seconds to pass completely under the district that gives her the reputation of being the best dressed woman in the world. In those 65 seconds, the subway re ran beneath a tiny area between 35th and 41st Streets, Broadway to 9th Avenue. Many New Yorkers can tell you about aspects of the garment district. They can tell you about labor strife, for example, or they have images of congested streets with racks filled with dresses careening through the streets. These are being pushed by what I came to, I've come to know are push boys. It doesn't matter how old they are, but they were always push boys. Yet if you ask people about the buildings, you get a blank stare. Virtually nothing has been written about the physical fabric of the garment district. The seemingly comprehensive 1,055-page AIA Guide to New York City does not mention a single garment district building, including the Great Art Deco Towers, which are not mentioned in, in the AIA Guide. Why are the buildings that comprise a district so ingrained in the history of the city so widely ignored? Among other issues addressed on Saturday, Jack Goldstein talked about the Broadway Theater District. Regardless of the size of the theater, uh, that from an actor's perspective and an audience perspective makes that theater experience possible. And architectural historian Carrie Culhane talked about Mayor Bloomberg's recent proposal to rezone Manhattan's Midtown East. So I'm going to focus on the story of how preservationists are trying to work to um, uh, see that landmarking is done where appropriate in the neighborhood. So uh, the premise is that uh, around the core of Grand Central, which is the red square, um, the FAR, which is the floor area ratio, which is sort of footprint to height ratio, would increase from what is existing uh, 15 FAR to 24, which is really tall. Um, and the sites that qualify th for this have some site constraints, so it's not a necessarily across the board, um, but there certainly is the potential for developers to aggregate sites to meet these minimum site requirements, which is a 25,000 square foot footprint. Um, and then you can see sort of going up Park Avenue, there would also be a higher FAR. 
So across the board, the FAR would uh, increase, which would mean that builders would get free land. You could grow taller and, um, and build bigger buildings. And the planning department's theory is that nobody's building enough in Midtown. Um, and we need to um, update our outmoded building stock so that it's more attractive to um, businesses to come and move in. Uh, there's also the Second Avenue subway that's coming in. So many see this as sort of a speculative boom in advance of um, increased infrastructure for transportation. There is also a huge burden that's going to be placed on infrastructure in this area if the bulk is increased. So there is also a proposal to um, create a system whereby uh, developers would pay into uh, a DIB program and that would fund some infrastructure. But the math doesn't exactly work out if you look at how much infrastructure needs to be improved. If anyone has walked on the sidewalk in Midtown during rush hour. It almost looks like a picture that um, we saw recently of a historic um, garment district. Um, and so um, in addition to this sort of as of right framework for um, new upzoning, there is a special permit that could be um, granted. And that would increase the FAR around Grand Central Terminal to 30, which um, to give you an idea of what um, the as of right FAR would be, if you can look um, at the blue rectangle, um, that is the as of right development and that's actually right next to the MetLife building so it shows you that it's taller than the MetLife building and it's almost as tall as the Chrysler building. I don't have an image, DCP doesn't, didn't share an image of um, what the special permit FAR height would be but it would actually be taller than the Chrysler building. Lacey Tauber, Interim Academic Coordinator for Pratt Institute's Graduate Program in Historic Preservation and Planning, addressed Greenpoint and Williamsburg. North Brooklyn has a long history of community activism. In the early 90s, residents came together to fight the location of an illegal waste transfer station on the waterfront, as well as a proposed power plant, um, arguing that the public should have access to the water. Donald Brennan of Brennan Real Estate spoke to several historic Brooklyn neighborhoods. The imbalance of, of the power and resources that people have at their disposal to take action to preserve are at a disadvantage to the powers on the other side of the equation. And John Reddick presented In Context, Harlem's Past and Future, focusing on the area's uniqueness and his own personal relationship to it. I feel like all of you through these stories have had an African-American experience. <laughs> uh, so that's so where we're simpatico, just, uh, Based on that, I mean, and, and, and Dr. Price's talk uh, yesterday was talking about uh, sort of monuments and some, actually some of the more difficult issues around African-American history and the commemorating of it. And I really feel that African-Americans, and I'm over that age now where I'm being solicited by AARP, and uh, I, you know, I feel like it should bring with it some sage uh, sort of look at history and the past. And I say this without malice. I sort of, as I look at American history and my experiences in preservation and, and these uh, cultural monuments in Harlem, that the African-American is the barometer to, by which everyone else decides they're wrong in the American, uh, the lexicon of being an American and, and sort of their success or less than success uh, in America. And I kind of accept that because I also take great pride in what the African American experience, both in intelligence, uh, uh, endurance, uh, joy, and in periods of protest have done to advance the broader culture uh, altogether. So if you look at the civil rights movement and then you look at the post-civil rights and, and for women and, and gays and handicapped, our moving forward is, it awakens other groups to say, well, well, what about us? And, you know, and that, trans, that transfer of value not only help, is the personal identification, it also gets reflected over into what has value in the marketplace or uh, in terms of property and uh, uh, powers that be in terms of de making decisions about neighborhoods and, and uh, that value. While Sunday was spent on a walking tour of many of the city's most important neighborhoods, the preservation fair on Saturday was incredibly well received. I think the conference succeeds in bringing people from all parts of the city to the table and makes preservation come alive in new ways. It's a great chance to see people you don't generally see very often, schmooze, make contacts, and the speakers and the uh, walking tours and the lectures really help you see what else is going on. I feel fortunate to be here as a student of New York history 
and it's about you know, learning about New York City's past, but also learning about different neighborhoods that I might not otherwise visit. Um, I, I leave here feeling that there's so much else I want to see in New York. All in attendance felt that the conference was an enormous success and are no doubt already looking forward to next year.